Welcome all you wiretappers out there. I'm here on a Zoom call. As you know, I'm doing all my shows on a Zoom call uh, with Sean Patrick Griffin. Now, uh, Sean Patrick Griffin is a really interesting guy. First of all, he's a former copper, just like me. He was on the uh, Philadelphia Police Department. And uh, I'm not sure exactly how long. We're going to ask him in just a minute. And then he went on to get some advanced degrees, just like I did. And, and has written a little bit, and I've not really written any uh, 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 academic papers or articles like he has. Mine's more uh, sloppy kind of writing, you know. But uh, but we've got, we've got similar tracks uh, uh, in our careers in our lives. So Sean, it's really good to have you on here. Thanks for having me, Gary. So Sean, I guess first of all, uh, as we talked a little bit ago before we came started recording. Tell uh, the listeners out there, we, uh, we call each other wiretappers here on, in this because I've made extensive use of, of wiretaps and, and uh, uh, video audio from wiretaps that I got from an investigation we did in Kansas City. So tell the wiretappers a little bit about your career. You were, uh, what did you do on the PD and then how did you happen to go into academia? Sure. Well, I went on the Philadelphia Police Department uh, almost by mistake. It was not a, a career plan. It's a very long story. I originally planned on being an FBI agent. Yeah. And uh, of course, if you, if you come out of college with a four-year degree, as I did in criminal justice, that wasn't enough. You either had to be an accountant or some special person or have an accelerated degree in addition to field experience. Uh, so I thought, well, I can go on the Philadelphia Police Department, pay off student loans, which was a big deal to me, and get field experience to become an FBI agent. Um, for those who don't know, my father was a police officer. My brother is still a Philadelphia homicide detective. Uh, between the three of us, we have more than 60 years of experience in the Philadelphia Police Department. And when I was on the job, I started going for my master's degree. And when my mentors at Penn State heard what I was doing, they thought I was crazy. They, they wanted me to go into academia. Well, I thought they were crazy because, you know, I'm a working class kid from Philly. I don't know anything about PhDs and academic journals and all that. Even though I loved academia, I was lucky. I had great professors when I was a student. And um, anyway, so I had this fateful decision. I applied for the FBI. I was going through the process and I'll, I'll never forget where I was when I made the call. I called my FBI recruiter. I told her that um, I was going to choose academia. And so I went on and got my PhD. A lot of people ask me if my policing has to do with my research. And the truth is, it really doesn't. I was just a regular street cop. Unlike you, I didn't wiretap anybody. I was just a street <laughs> cop. Now, my brother probably could talk to you about that. My, yeah. my father and I are both just regular cops. And, um, and so uh, when I went into academia, uh, my main focus was organized crime. I was lucky. Um, probably the definitely a top three organized crime expert at the time was a guy named Alan Block. He has since passed away, but um, I went to study under Alan because uh, he was just a trailblazer back in the 60s and 70s, back when organized crime was just becoming a topic to be studied. Right. And, um, and I thought, well, and, and for those, for your audience who doesn't know, it's really not good. You're not supposed to get all, your, all of your degrees from the same institution. And I just thought it was backwards. Well, why would I go to another school when the guy is just so happens to be at Penn State? So um, I went and got my PhD from Penn State. It was an amazing experience. And when he and I co-authored pieces, a lot of people, even back then, when they say co-authored, you know, somebody would do a chapter or a chapter here and you'd meet together. We literally sat next to each other for years writing together. Hmm. And seeing how one of the best people in history wrote about organized crime and how he did his research and his connections and his networks, it was just unbelievable. It was just unbelievable. And his threshold for what you would put into print, Alan would always say, and I now say the same thing, he would always say that, do oh, I think a lot of things happen? Yeah, but that's a different matter than me writing it in a book that people are going to rely on 30 or 50 years from now as history. And I, I do the same thing. And so if you and I got together for beers, trust me. I could go on for hours and hours and hours about things I've heard and things I believe, but that's not going to appear in print, you know? Yeah. And so um, I got my PhD at Penn state and then uh, I went into academia and it's been great ever since. And I, I'm lucky. A lot of my colleagues write about things that don't lend themselves to mainstream readership. Like for instance, a lot of my policing research, it can only go into an academic journal. The, the public doesn't even know it exists. Yeah. You know, it's academics talking to other academics. 
maybe some police departments are aware of it, probably not. But because my organized crime stuff can be mainstream and people love organized crime, um, I've written books that I try and straddle the things. I actually wrote a foreword in one of my books where I said, the challenge, if you're in my line of work, is if you study organized crime, you typically get one of two types of books. Either academic books were incredibly sourced, which you and I can rely on as history, but man, it's dense, boring reading. Right. Or you get the other genre, which is supposedly true crime books, but there's no sources, no citations. And you and I, we maybe it's real, but you don't really know. And so my goal is always to bridge that gap so that you and I can 30 years from now go, well, if Griffin wrote it, that's what happened. And if you want to do a follow-up research, look at fo you know, footnotes 49 and 50. They'll take you to the data or to the interview subjects or whatever. And, and so that's pretty much what I have. But my, my claim to fame has been getting stuff. I routinely have people in the FBI or our law enforcement agencies saying, how did you get that? Because I, 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 I use FOIA, but I don't really rely on it. I rely on unredacted documents mostly. Yeah, that was FOIA. What he said was FOIA or Freedom of Information Act, folks. And, and I've done that, and they're so redacted that uh, you, you can fill in if you are really familiar with the topic and the people, but they're so redacted. So it's, uh, you know, gathering information, uh, real solid information is hard. It's easy to gather myths and stories because there's a thousand stories out there mm -hmm. and several different versions of each well-known story, of course. And, and, but uh, yeah. Uh, and, if you, and, and for your listeners who use FOIA, be prepared to use a lot of toner cartridge because there's just a lot of black redactions. <laughs> yes, that's true. I've had whole pages of black. Of course, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but there, it, you know, it helps. It helps. FOIA does, and and you can get some pretty good little uh, tips mm -hmm. out of that. Yep. But you got to mm -hmm. be able to fill in some of the blanks too. So it's uh, to gather that information is. Uh, it's a, it's a real skill in itself, just doing the research and find the people. Now, you sound like you've been able to talk to some people as well as finding some primary source documents. Now, how, yeah. how would you rate like newspaper articles as primary source documents? Uh, well, they're in, in my field, they're not considered primary source okay. documents. But I will say this, if you're doing, we're probably going to talk about Philadelphia's Black Mafia. If you're doing that sort of research, archival research about things in the 50s, 60s, 70s, I would argue those are different than today. At those journalists, they were researchers. They were really doing no joke journalism back then. And so for the most part, you can't rely on them, but they're great windows into where to look. And I have a great deal of uh, respect for the people who did work back then. Now it's it's just a, it's a different world. Um, some some uh, newspapers don't even have journal don't have investigative journalists that actually do their own research. They're you know, you know you've probably heard the expression that many newspapers now are literally just press releases from the local DA's office or whatever. They just print what's given to them and and that's yeah. it. Um, and I'm not criticizing them if that's their business model. It is what it is. But you and I as researchers, that's that's a problem. Yeah. And. Um, you know, so the other thing, too, is back then, it was very common, in my case, in Philly, the organized crime investigators, they weren't necessarily friendly with law enforcement. There was sort of a tension, but each party understood the value of the other. Yeah. And um, so, yes, the reporters, on the most part, were always muckrakers and looking to fight the system, but um, there were plenty of times where facts are facts. And so... It, uh, I, I don't use them as primary sources, but you'd be a fool not to at least, you know, consider them and use them as windows into where you're going to go. Oh, yeah. I, I, I used to always keep a journalist, a, a reporter or two, you know, kind of uh, as my pal, and I'd slip them little yeah. things. And, and, you know, they tell me stuff, too, and, and always had that. And, I, and there in Philadelphia, you've got a couple of great guys, uh, Dave Stratweiser and uh, George Anastasia. Yeah. I mean, yeah, those yeah, guys yeah. are dynamite. Those, yes. those, and that George Anastasia, he knows that stuff. And, yeah. And they know people. Well, that's the, well, they, by the way, there's a great, that's a great example, right? If you talk to Schrattweiser or Anastasia, they know people on both sides of every story. Right. They're, they're no joke journalists. They've yeah. been through, they've been doing this for decades. And unfortunately, that's a dying breed. Yeah, it is. We don't, we, we've got one young kid here in Kansas City that I still maintain contact with, though, that kind of tries, but he doesn't have any help and they keep him so busy doing other stories and, and other things that, uh, he just, you know, it, it's difficult for him. 
Well, the thing, the thing is, it's hard for people to understand. If you talk to somebody like you or me or Stratwise or Anastasia, or, especially if you're physically in the place, you can go to talk to all these people. Yeah. You can actually, you, and one of the things that I think the public doesn't understand, this is especially true for law enforcement people. I can't tell you how many friends of mine in law enforcement keep their own files, either because a case was noteworthy or because they think it didn't turn out correctly and they think a case got dropped or the, they weren't getting enough funding. And then you or I come along and say, hey, I'm researching whatever. Oh my goodness. And meanwhile, they've got boxes in their basement, you know, here, take them. Yeah. You know, it, it's so I, I just think people, if people aren't willing to make the phone calls and do the legwork and, and travel, they're, they're not aware of all the things that are out there. Yeah, that's true. That is true. So let's, uh, let's talk about the black mafia there in Philadelphia. It's, uh, you, you said some interesting things about the development of mafia in an article that I read when I first kind of got on to found out about you and that I found interesting. And, and that's how do people, how do these ethnic minorities get into organized crime? Because if you think back, there's, uh, you know, the Italians, of course, kind of were the, the first ones. They, they brought the structure with them from Sicily. But by the 30s, you know, prohibition came along and, and really the, the English and the Irish already had all the good jobs and they were not letting them in the good jobs, even being policemen or firemen for the most part, just a few. Uh, so they went into organized crime because you had all these young guys who were bright and, and uh, had native intelligence out the ass. And they, if they'd been led into some kind of business, they would have done well, but they were squeezed out of, you know, couldn't get loans. They, nobody was going to do business with them because they were Italian. You know, they looked a little different. They, they maybe didn't speak English perfectly and with an accent. And so they went into organized crime to make a ton of money. And, and then other ethnic minorities have done the same thing. The young Jewish guys, uh, Marlansky and people like that, had they been able to go right into some kind of legitimate business and been brought in by somebody who was already here in the States, they would, he wouldn't end up being, you know, the banker for the mob. He wouldn't end up being Mr. Casino, Mr. You know, Mr. Money Man for the mob. He would have been, you know, the owner of a real bank or the, you know, CEO of a big corporation. So also, you know, Greeks the same way and, and now and blacks. And, and so African-American people have notoriously been kept squeezed out from those kinds of things. I mean, we've got all kinds of reports, redlining, you can't get loans. There's just a lot of ways that African-Americans have been squeezed out. And, and to me, drugs came along and, and boy, they, those young guys that are being squeezed out, they saw a way to make money and, and make big money. And, and, you know, to do any kind of, crime on an organized basis like that, you got to form an organization. And it's always usually ends up with the title of mafia. You know, that's kind of a general term, uh, uh, even though it's really Sicilian in nature. But, you know, what's the Russians, the Russian mob, the Russian mafia. So you got the black mafia. So how did that develop there in uh, uh, Philadelphia? Well, the thing is, most major cities had uh, black organized crime as early as the late 1800s. Um, because they didn't have access to banking, it meant that by definition, they had to find an alternative series source of funds. And so local numbers run is especially, which back then was, wasn't called numbers, called policy. Right. The policy people were the banks for the local neighborhoods. And that was true all throughout the country for decades. Yeah, we had one but, in Kansas City, a guy named uh, 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 Peyton. Uh, he, he was the banker and he had the policy and he had several bars and he was active in politics and he right, joined right. with the Irish organization to right. help get the vote out. And actually right. he converted all the African-Americans from Republican because they all were Republican before because Lincoln won the war. And, and now he turned them all into Democrats to go with the machine. So I bet you got the same thing. And well, that's the, that look, it was going on all throughout the country. I mean, W.E.B. Du Bois wrote, wrote his famous study in 1899, the Philadelphia Negro. Now it's about Philly, obviously, but it's not. It's a microcosm of what was going on throughout the entire country. There's an entire section of what he called Negro Vice. And that's what he talks about. The influence of those people in that neighborhood or in those neighborhoods. And they had incredible political power. 
And for, for good reason, it was a patronage service, no different than the Irish are doing with policing and firefighting and trash hauling jobs. It, it, this is really not complicated, but it's complicated because the media and academics never talked about it. That's, that's the only reason it's so noteworthy. But getting back to your question, um, Philly's Black Mafia, it, we don't know when it started. Um, the, the, common, the conventional wisdom, the common theme was they started in the mid 60s. I always put a footnote on that only because when I started my research in the 90s about this, I was lucky. I had the benefit of 20 years of hindsight. So I now knew roughly what the group was supposed to look like. I knew who the main people were. So I could go back and look at court records, law intelligence, intelligence files, and, and newspaper articles back to the 50s. And what you wound up seeing were clusters of these guys being arrested together. So they knew each other for years, whether that was an organized crime racket, it doesn't matter. But yeah, by the time you get to the mid 60s, they're actually calling themselves the Black Mafia, which was smart, by the way, if you're going to be there, they were mainly an extortion group, they extorted drug dealers and all people who did illicit business, bar, especially bar owners who allowed gambling in their in their joint or prostitution upstairs, people who couldn't go to law enforcement with the grievance about being extorted, right? It's good, good organized crime. Well, anyway, um, the only way you can do that is if you have a name for yourself. And so they called themselves the Black Mafia. And what's interesting is even though law enforcement at the time was only looking at Italians, I had the benefit of going back and looking at homicide records, intelligence files, and you see fleeting references from confidential informants or from murder files where they're saying, hey, you realize this is a Black Mafia murder, or hey, just, you know, the Black Mafia has been shaking me down and they're complaining to law enforcement. But there's no follow-up. See, that's the difference. It's not as though there weren't little flickers, but because they were so myopically focused on Italians, law enforcement didn't do anything. Yeah, they prosecute a murder. Obviously, they're going to prosecute a murder. They're going to prosecute a robbery. But they're not actually collecting intelligence and treating it like an organization. So same, started, same, here, same here in Kansas City. I remember those days because I worked uh, all black district and I'd come up with things and I'd say, well, like, well, this guy, he seems to have some control over these other people. And I have a guy tell me how he can get this and get that for you. And he's got some, uh, a little crew of, of a grocery store robbers that go out and he furnishes some cars and, and then they come back and meet him. So I get hold of our intelligence people at the time and they looked at me like I had two heads and, and I could tell they didn't really care. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Well, that's not where the funding was either, you know, back right. then. You know, uh, late 60s, early 70s, when all that federal money is getting pushed into organized crime, they're only talking about Italians. Yeah. So, you know, and the York, by the way, you, know, I, I, you probably know this, but, you know, in New York, it was originally called the Italian Squad. I mean, they weren't even joking about who they were going after. And Philly was the same thing. It was called Intercept, which was short for the internal, oh, I used to know this, uh, but uh, it was, it was the internal security against the emerging Italian threat. I mean, ridiculous stuff. They really thought that there was this group of Italians that were subversive and going to try and throw over the government. Crazy. But meanwhile, if you're an Irish gangster or a black gangster or a Greek gangster, you're loving life because no one's looking at you. And so anyway, they, um, they made their name in the 60s, especially the 60s and 70s, where because they were focused mainly on extorting people, they weren't dealing drugs at that point. They were just extorting people. Well, that meant a lot of violence. So that they would get, if you couldn't go up to another drug dealer and say, pay me 200 bucks or 300 bucks a week, if there wasn't a payback, you know, why would I pay you? Well, I'll tell you why you're going to pay me. And so they committed a ton of murders, but the murders were never solved. Everyone knew who did it. You know, you know, in, the, in, 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 in law enforcement parlance, you know, the, the homicides internally were cleared because they knew who did it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Nobody was ever prosecuted because people were just petrified. And this is, of course, before we have a term for this. Now, of course, it's the stop snitching campaign. Yeah. Well, this was the 1960s Philly version of stop snitching. Yeah, well, yeah there was that. I mean, it, any... Uh, any ethnic minority that lives is kind of ghettoized and all live together in the same geographic area. It's, you got to work like heck yep. to even get information out of them. They usually get an informant, but to get a witness is almost impossible. Yeah, right. It's, yeah. you know, Cause they got to go back. I used to, you know, I understand you got to go back there and live, don't you? And he said, yep. yep, that's true. I, I just can't do this because yep. my family, yeah. they'll burn my house down. You know, yes. it's, it's just, you know, you were just dead. Well, the other thing is we all focus on the high profile things in the media or in Hollywood where somebody's in the witness protection program. Yeah. And 
first of all, that only started in 1968, which was a new phenomenon. But even beyond that, local jurisdictions don't have those resources. Right. We didn't. So have you, you can't say to somebody, to your point, that, oh, well, we'll take care of you. They yeah. can't take care of you. They are literally yeah. going back to that neighborhood where everybody knows is running the neighborhood. And it's going to be very clear the one or two or three people who had to be responsible for this prosecution. So they just couldn't. In fact, in, 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 my, in my book, Black Brothers Incorporated, there are, oh my gosh, there have to be at least five witnesses who were killed before trial because they got snuffed out by the Black Mafia they were killed in advance. And, and look, for your listeners who don't know, the way that works on the street is you don't have to kill every witness. You kill a few and people get the message. You just kill one well, and they get the yeah, message. Exactly. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. So did, did your guys have, did they uh, have any liaison with the Italian oh, family? Yeah, they, we, they were, we they were close here. friends. Yeah, okay. they were close friends, yeah. Essentially, the way, the way Philadelphia worked back then, it's still true now, but especially true back then. For those are people not familiar with Philadelphia, um, South Philadelphia, which everyone knows from the, if you ever watch Philadelphia sports or concerts, that's all in South Philadelphia. It's all in a okay. specific okay. area. People have seen the Rocky movies. They know the Italian market, you know, all, all of South Philadelphia. Yeah. Well, um, Broad Street in Philadelphia is essentially 14th Street. So it goes 13th, Broad, 15th, and so on. East of Broad Street, meaning the numbers from 13th down to nothing, down to the Delaware River, which splits Philadelphia and New Jersey, that was all Italian territory. And west of Broad, meaning 15th and up, was Black Mafia stuff. They, people want to think for some reason that these guys would clash. Organized crime is fluid. You never know who's going to stiff you over on a drug deal, on a numbers running operation, fill in the blank. So generally speaking, in the underworld, these guys are all somewhat friendly because you never know where you need money or a lawyer. And, you know, I always say to students, if I gave you a million bucks tomorrow of hot money, what are you going to do with it? And of course, they have all sorts of crazy ideas, but no one really thinks through, yeah, well, that actually becomes a problem in some way. You really do have to have a way to deal with that money. So they all, in Philly especially, they had a great relationship, uh, with the, which was the Bruno family when it started. Uh, pardon me. Uh, yeah, yeah, Angela Bruno. And then it wound up being the Starfo family when Bruno was still meeting. But they got along great. With one exception, there was a case in the summer of 1973. This is a funny story, actually, where uh, a bunch of Italian numbers runners were being extorted by Philadelphia's Black Mafia. Well, the, the, the people who get extorted complain to the Italian mobsters, and they tell the Bruno family guys, hey, this is not right. You're, we're paying you, and now we're paying the Black Mafia guys. We, we can't afford this. Well, instead of a, a, a turf war, what winds up happening, the Italian mobsters go to Philadelphia Police Department's organized crime unit and complain about the Black Mafia coming in on their territory. <laughs> And so there's a great, um, I actually have a blog post on my website about this. There's a great uh, Philadelphia Magazine expose in the summer of 73, where they say, um, you know, mob war, and it's a super fly black mafia gangster model with his back against a, uh, an Italian black mafia gangster. And the plan, the, the, the worry was there was going to be this mob war because of this turf battle and stuff. And it turns out nothing happened, and the Bruno family acceded to the black mafia in that one limited regard. But for the most part, they got along great. And the thing is, they had a handful of intermediaries. Uh, one I talked about is a guy named Major Coxon. He was not a member of the Black Mafia. Um, some of your uh, viewers may know uh, he ran for mayor of Camden, New Jersey in 1973. Uh, in fact, if you ever see the movie American Hustle, uh, which was a very, very popular movie, which is about the Abscam situation in New Jersey. Oh, yeah, and, yeah right? I saw that. Well, when Major Coxon ran for mayor of Camden, New Jersey, the reporters said, wait a second, you're a career felon. You serve time in federal prison. Don't you have some nerve running for mayor of Camden, New Jersey? And his, Major Coxon's quote was, hey, in New Jersey, typically people run for office, get elected, and then he gets convicted. I'm reversing the trend. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and it was funny. He was, he was prophetic because he lost to Angelo Arachetti, who wound up getting prosecuted and convicted of the Nash game, which is where that movie came from. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> but anyway, so Major Coxon was the intermediary between Philadelphia's Black Mafia and the Italian mobsters. And they got along great for years. It yeah. was never. A, and by the way, that's actually. This is related to an earlier question you asked me. Part of the challenge, if you're a black Philadelphian 
in the 60s and 70s. And you've got these black gangsters who are preying on your neighborhoods, your businesses. You can't understand why law enforcement isn't doing anything about this. And then somebody like Major Coxon is doing political rallies with Muhammad Ali in New Jersey and running for mayor. And he's hanging out at City Hall in Philly and he's on TV all the time. But he, they know that he's tight with all the black mafia leaders. They just they had to they kept assuming that somebody had to be getting paid off because this didn't make sense. And it just never occurred to them that law enforcement just didn't know, didn't care. And the black community got screwed. Yeah. Uh, pretty much the same thing here. And we had one, one guy that was like the kind of liaison. He wasn't so much of a politician, but he was just, he was a guy that, that knew everybody. And, and he wasn't even a full Italian, and, uh, but he knew everybody and he would go between the two. And if they wanted a liaison about something, wanted to get something done, why he was the guy that would be in the middle of that. Yeah. So, well, Major Coxon was smart too. He owned a bunch of nightclubs. And you'd see the who's who of Philly, people who were in town from out, out of town. I'm talking whites and blacks, like major celebrities, sports stars. Wow. That, that was just know you at the time. That's by like the um, April 4th, 1972 murder at the Club Harlem in New Jersey, where Fat Ty Palmer was killed. There were major acts that played there. Sinatra, you know, Dean Martin. That was, like, these, these were not, quote unquote, black establishments. They, they were, it was a different time uh, back then. Well, put it this way, at least in Philly and South Jersey it was. I don't know about the rest of the country. But um, that's why it was very complicated and, and confusing to the media and to law enforcement. Uh, so uh, now they must have moved into drugs. When That's what happened here. When, when heroin came, got so popular in the 70s, they moved in on heroin. It's called, they called themselves the uh, Purple Capsule Gang. And, and they actually were, were responsible for killing a black politician who the Italians wanted out of the way. Uh, and, and they had this guy who had gone to them and set all that up. So that was, you know, so that, but they went on into heroin and then as those guys got taken off, that's when law enforcement really got onto them. When they went into heroin big time, mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, at the time it was called the uh, drug abuse law enforcement before the DEA and the Federal Bureau of Narcotics and, and kind of the end of that, they had two or three different names and therefore they became the DEA. So they moved in on that and, and started taking those guys off. But boy, after that, when cocaine came in and crack, it just, you know, it, they all went into that and, and mm -hmm. it, it really diversified, shall we say, there was no single organization after that. Well, in Philly, it was weird. They they didn't get involved in the drugs until like the mid 70s. Uh, the only reason they wound up on law enforcement's radar is because even though they were Philadelphia's black mafia, they were all along the East Coast. So um, Sam Christian was the founder of Philadelphia's black mafia. The only case in which he was ever successfully prosecuted was him shooting a New York City uh, police officer oh. a robbery in New York City. Uh, the Club Harlem shooting in Atlantic City was, of course, an interstate issue where Philadelphians were whatever, and that, that got the attention of the feds. The main case, the guy, Major Coxon, the, the mayoral candidate I just mentioned, he got murdered in June of 73. Again, it's Philadelphia guys going over to, to New Jersey, so it was interstate, so the feds got involved in that, but especially the January 1973 murder of the Hanafi Muslims, Sunni Muslims in D.C., where eight black mafia guys traveled down from Philadelphia to murder Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's mentor, Hamas abdul Khalis. I remember that. that. What, what was the story behind that? I can't, I can't remember. I remember that was a big deal at the time. No, no, it was, a national, it was a national story. Now, by the way, this was not, you can go back and look at all the newspaper articles. This was never reported as a Philadelphia black mafia murder, but that's exactly what it was. Um, for your listeners if, who don't know, the leadership of Philadelphia's black mafia were all members of the Nation of Islam Temple 12. And at the nation at the time was at war with a person who used to be a member of the nation. His name was originally Ernest McGee. When he went with the nation, he became Ernest X. When he left the nation, because he was convinced they were more a racial separatist organization than a political movement, and a, and a political movement rather than real religion, he founded what he called uh, Hanafi Islam, a version of Sunni Islam. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was his first convert. So the nation had Muhammad Ali, and now the, you know, the Sunnis and the Hanafis had Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Well, 
the guy's name was Hamas Abdul Khalis. He sends a letter out to all 56 Nation of Islam mosques, and it says all sorts of terrible things about Elijah Muhammad, the leader of the Nation of Islam. He calls him a false prophet and says all sorts of things. Within days, a hit squad is organized in Temple 12 in Philly of all the black mafia guys, and they go down to kill Hamas Abdul Khalis. Hamas ironically, is not home, so they decide to kill most of his family. They actually thought they killed all of them, but um, the people they shot, several of the people they shot, the bullets were old, so the lead was soft, and it actually hit their skulls and flattened. Hmm. So they left thinking they had eviscerated the family, and they didn't, but uh, they, they drowned four kids, including a nine-day-old baby. Wow. They slaughtered the whole family. There's a great line in the book where um, John Clark was the leader of that hit squad, and one of his uh, black mafia compatriots said, wait a second, why are you telling us to kill the kids? They had nothing to do with this and they can't be witnesses. So what is the benefit of killing the kids? And John Clark said, the seed of the hypocrite is in them, meaning they're the wrong Muslim sect. Mm -hmm. And so they, they killed the family. And, uh, and by the way, there's a footnote to that. If your followers want to do this, in 1977, Hamas Abdul Khalis was frustrated. For those who don't know, the death penalty was not constitutional at this point. So, yeah. so not only four of the eight black mafia guys get prosecuted, and even of those four, none of them get the death penalty. Hamas Abdul Khalis gets frustrated, and as a response, he takes people hostage at three buildings in D.C. in 1977. Uh, and he winds up getting prosecuted, convicted, and ironically, he dies in federal prison. Hmm. And the black mafia guys who killed his family, um, several of them never even served a day in prison. Wow. Yeah, That's it was a story. So anyway, so but to answer your question, they they never they didn't get on the radar because of drugs. They got on the radar because of their outrageous acts yeah. of violence all around the east east coast. They did get in. To your point, though, they did get in drugs. They made a big mistake. And for the would be drug dealers out there, this is the problem. If you extort drug dealers, you at least get to say, "Well, I'm the badass. Don't prosecute against me." You know, and you have to have, you have to have witnesses. Well, if you're the drug dealer, you're either on the wiretaps or you're not. Yep, you either yep. have the drugs on, you're going <laughs> to... Yep. So they got greedy like most people, and they start, instead of just taking a street tax, they took over the trade, and they wound up becoming a huge RICO case in 1974. And that's what took off the first level of Black Mafia guys. Interesting. Well, Sean, uh, this has been great. Uh, tell us a little bit more about your book, Philadelphia's Black Mafia, Social and Political History. Now, it sounds like and oh, you have another one that's a little more mainstream called Black Brothers Incorporated, the, the violent rise and fall of Philadelphia's Black Mafia. So probably the, uh, the Black Brothers would be the one that, that your regular citizens, shall we say, would want yeah, to read. That's, that's right. Yeah. yeah, Philadelphia's Black Mafia is a textbook. Okay. It's designed for classes of organized crime. It's answering basic questions. Okay. Is there such a thing as Black organized crime? How is it distinguished from Italians? All those sorts of things. Okay. Black Brothers is the one that you would see on your regular bookstore shelf. That if so, if I'm talking about the me, the murder of Major Coxon in a textbook, you don't need to know what the room looked like. Yeah, but we'll get that in Black Brothers Incorporated. <laughs> I got you. I'll tell you what. I got some listeners out there that are really into this and and like to study it. You know, almost from an academic standpoint, uh, they're not just being entertained by it, but I got a whole lot of people who want to be entertained. Myself, I want to be entertained anymore. So <laughs> I, I have read some of those uh, academic books and they are interesting, but uh, but I like to be entertained too. So you've done some uh, some uh, TV stuff or uh, you had a, uh, what did you do? What else did you do? Uh, yeah, we had a history a, channel and A and E network. You've done some stuff on that. Yeah, well, they yeah, it, it was interesting. Back in two thousand and seven, the BET had a TV show called American Gangster, and they would do specific episodes on specific organized crime groups. And then wow. they, they uh, the first episode of season two uh, was on Philadelphia's Black Mafia, and I felt bad for that producer. He was a great guy named Henry Shipper. How do you take forty years of history and put it into forty minutes? Right? Yeah, really, it's impossible. <laughs> But they did a great job. And uh, now, so it was originally shot for BET, but BET sold the rights to A&E, Discovery, and all yeah. that. So it's routinely on rotation. And uh, it's, it's online also. Okay. And uh, I've, done, I've done interviews. As you may know, we say that it's on A&E or Discovery, but none of those companies actually produce content. There are two yeah. or three production companies that do all of this. 
And so they'll sit me down for seven hours, eight hours, and interview me for a day in a suite somewhere. And then it appears in any number of different shows. <laughs> yeah. So uh, my, it's actually funny. A relative of mine sent me a screenshot. He was watching TV a couple months ago. And he said, I didn't know you were in this. And I said, I didn't know I was in that. It was a, it was a, it was a National Geographic show in organized crime. I don't know. I don't know where they yeah. put this yeah, interesting. I, I got involved with a company that was trying to do something on skim for National Geographic. They flew me back to Washington and or to Bethesda, Maryland, and, and we they did a long interview with me. And then I, I got hold of them, this was like over a year ago, and I got hold of them recently. And they said, well, we ended up going another way. <laughs> so <laughs> so much of my claim to fame. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to be careful. It's, it's, it's on tape somewhere. You never yeah, know. yeah, that's true. It is. So I, I bet there's a lot more stories in that uh, Black Brothers that you guys need to get out there and, and get that book. I, I think it would be pretty entertaining and interesting and a different, a look at a little different. You know, it's not the old Lucky Luciano. We all know way too much about <laughs> New York organized crime, I think, and a lot of people agree with me. Yeah, but one, thing, one thing, Gary, one thing that's interesting is Philadelphia's Black Mafia yeah, they're not what they used to be. No organized crime is what they used to be because the feds have figured out how to prosecute. <laughs> oh, yeah. But, but straight through a few years ago, the black mafia guys have been in the news, they and their offspring. Uh, the largest cocaine seizure in Philadelphia history two or three years ago, black mafia. Still doing they're, it. Still, they're still out there. You know, they get out of prison and, of course, they're not, you know, they don't become bankers. They go right back on the street. So, yeah. Um, it's not, it's not a dated story whatsoever. What, be, right before I, I moved to Charleston a few years ago, before I did, I was still lecturing the DA's office up there and the FBI, because even though these new FBI agents or new DA's thought it was a dated story, it's not, because if you look at those Intel files, it's a roadmap into what the street looks like today. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I would kind of see the same thing or I see the same thing. I see some of those same names. I remember back in the day, their, you know, their kids and grandkids are getting arrested for something. And so, yeah, uh, so and especially in the Italian mafia, but even uh, in the African-American community too, you see that, uh, that same thing here. So you got another book and I want you to come back and talk about this one. Gaming the game, the story behind the NBA betting scandal and the gambler who made it happen. Now, is that the, the uh, betting scandal that uh, Henry Hill was involved in? No. It's a different one. Okay. Yeah, this, this one's about the 2003-2007 uh, NBA betting scandal involving referee Tim Donahue. Oh, yeah, Tim Donahue. Yeah. You know, actually, I tried to get hold of him. And I, he, he, acted, he emailed back, and he was going to do it. Then something happened. I don't remember what, but uh, – well, maybe he heard you were talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're not his favorite person. Huh? <laughs> he, he seemed like he was a little bit thin-skinned, and from what I could find out about him, and and a little bit hard to deal with. So, uh, well, hey, well, well, if you're lucky enough to get access to him, I'll give you a handful of questions to ask him. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> interesting. Interesting. <laughs> Because right. that's just, you know, Gary, that's part of the problem. We, we, I said at the very beginning of this interview that in our business with organized crime, there's so much mythology parading yeah. this history. There's a great example where that guy has been interviewed, I don't know, gotta be it, 500 times. I mean, crazy. You know, you know the book, his book came out in 2009. And uh, it's just unreal. And people just give him a microphone. Well, it's all fake. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, I debunked it in 2011. Yeah. And I know, I know he's going for clicks and ratings, but my goodness, um, you know, they, they, he needs somebody like you to, um, you know, actually ask questions <laughs> and follow ups. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it just. Uh, it's, it, anyway, I could talk for hours about yeah. that. Maybe I will. But uh, <laughs> well, we will. We will next time. We'll we'll do this again, uh, Sean. I appreciate yeah. it, and I really appreciate you being on the show. Is there anything else that uh, uh, that folks need to know about? They can go to learn a more a little more about your work. Uh, yeah, actually, thank you for asking. Uh, my website is Sean Patrick Griffin. S uh, Sean S E A N Patrick P A T R I C K Griffin G R I F F I N dot net. And the reason I say that, it's not because you have to buy my books, especially with the NBA betting scandal. I was so frustrated at all the misinformation with that. All of the data, all the files, all the betting, all, anything I could put online to resolve this forever is on my, on my website. So that people can do their own research and come to their own conclusions. Uh, and anytime something that pops up related to my research, I blog about it and it's all sourced. My website is sourced no different than in my books. So that would be good. Sean Patrick, yeah, 
I got a bunch of guys out there that'll be doing that. I promise you that because they're they're really into it and, and they are into more than just the myths. Matter of fact, they they start hearing some of these myths and they uh, they want to start calling me on it and and you really see it on Facebook where uh, we we uh, perpetuate some myths and and sometimes I always say don't let the facts get in the way of a good story. So, <laughs> but I, I'll never say something as a fact when I don't really know for sure. I'll Thank try you. to differentiate, but but we don't like to get the facts get in the way of a good story. <laughs> and exactly. you, sometimes you just got to take it on, exactly. on, yeah. on its face, you know. And, right. and I, that's why I've never written an academic book for sure, not because it's really hard, I know, to footnote everything, but I don't want anybody footnoting to my work. <laughs> it's just, it's, <laughs> I don't want to prevent, you know, if you say something orally, it's one thing, but when you write it down in a book, then somebody is going to take that right. and copy it and put it somewhere else and somewhere yeah. else. So it's, right, uh, right, right, right. Uh, and there's a lot of myth out there. And, and uh, these guys uh, uh, that follow the mob, they know who they are. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I'm trying to, oh, Henry Hill, I mentioned his name. You talk right. about myths, that guy, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that guy, yeah. he, he put some stuff out there. So, and, and there's been uh, Frank Culotta who just made rest in peace. And he was a good guy. But boy, he <laughs> he told a lot of stories too. That uh, right. you know, he didn't let the facts get in the way of a good story either. Now he lived the life, and he he did a lot of it. But right. but he's like a lot of us. He he you know, you got to tie everything together in a neat package. Otherwise, people get bored. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, that's true. That's true. you know what I mean. Right. All right, Sean. John Patrick Griffin. You guys, you need to get out and get on his website first of all and especially about this betting scandal. And we're going to have you come back on here in the next couple of months and, and we'll talk about that story. Would that be okay? That'd be great. All right. Thanks a lot, Sean. Thanks, Gary. Right. Hey, uh